course, you know, the, the future is to, to the youth, to the young people. And people like myself, I'm, I'm happy and very glad to see lots of young people coming along. If I travel along the innovation hubs, I'm absolutely in awe of what, um, what the young people are doing. And I see this as an absolutely fantastic future ahead of us. But it's not just about technology, it's also about business models. You know, one of the big, city, big problems with cities that I already mentioned is the fact that, you know, what are the business models, what are the funding models? Uh, that's a hard nut to crack, it's a crack, it's not easy, yeah? And uh, it's really good to uh, put these sort of things up front. And we've got both a brilliant young man as well as a fantastic topic that is going to address these, um, uh, these issues. So it's with great pleasure that I would like to welcome uh, Phil Northworthy here at uh, the stage to talk about futurist and uh, the, sorry, the business survival depends on your ability to recognize opportunity. Please welcome Phil. If love is tragedy, well, good morning. How are you? Can I ask? It's a actual, that's a non-rhetorical question. How are you guys? Are you good? Good. It was about this time last year that I found myself in Orlando. Has anybody gone to Orlando? Maybe just for the theme parks? Because if you've been there, you know it's a long flight, especially if you've gone with your kids on that flight. It's a long flight, isn't it? Sydney is home for me, but I spend about 120 nights a year on the road, and Orlando is, is oh, well, that's, a, that's a long way. It takes you about 30 hours door to door. And I was in Orlando, I'm going to come down here, guys. Um, I was in Orlando because I was hosting for Microsoft um, the MGX event. So if you guys are, are across MGX, it's their global sales summit. You get seven or 8,000 people into this event every single year and I was there to kind of, you know, steady things along and introduce people and we were welcoming onto the stage um, Judson Altoff and Jean-Philippe Cousin, if you know these guys, so very, very senior executives at Microsoft. And I remember getting off this plane, 30 hours door to door and feeling very, very foggy. Has anybody traveled? Does anybody travel well? You know, some people travel really well. You look like somebody who travels well. I'm the opposite. I mean, I like, I, like, I like to do it, I love it, but chances are, if you catch me on the other side of a flight, um, I'll look like something like The Walking Dead. Is anybody with me? Especially if it's 30 hours. So I remember getting off this flight in Orlando, and it was the middle of the night, and, um, and you know, you, you get to the airport, you jump into the Uber, and somewhere close to the, to the hotel where I was staying, I realized that I'd left my zippy bag on the flight. Has anybody done anything like that? Like you're so absent-minded after a long journey like this that you leave all of your cables. Now this is usually not so consequential, but I tell you what, if you're opening the major event for Microsoft the very next day and introducing their very senior executive team, you kind of want to make sure that your equipment has battery. Because in my zippy bag, it wasn't just like lip balm for the flight, I'm talking about all of my cables, HDMI cables, my clicker, like basically my tech equipment. And so I'm freaking out because it's one o'clock in the morning. So I arrived at this hotel and I said to the concierge, you've got to help me. Like, I'm opening this event tomorrow, but all of my devices are flat, I've got to check. Ah. He said, friend, this is America. He said, there's a Best Buy down the road. So I said, good news, because here's in the middle of the night, I went across to Best Buy, and this is like a sight to behold. Have you ever gone shopping in the middle of the night in the United States? There are hundreds and hundreds of people. This is 1.30 a.m. in the morning, and I am grateful and glad. Now, here's an interesting part of this story that you need to be across. I got into a car that the hotel had arranged for me. Not only was it I slightly foggy in the head, but it was a car that I had never seen before. This is one of these white kind of Lincoln town cars. Now, you guys are probably much smarter than I am, and so you know exactly what that vehicle is. But here I am, zombie mode. No idea, sitting in the front seat, talking to the gentleman, 15 minutes across town, and as soon as we pulled into the driveway at Best Buy, boof, Floridian, middle of the night, thunderstorm erupted, and here I was, I'm thinking, this is so much fun. Have you ever had one of those midnight debacle adventures and you're thinking to yourself, it's just chaos after chaos after chaos. The driver leant over to me and he said, don't worry, um, I'll do laps of the car park because otherwise you're going to get everything soaked to the core. I'll do laps and when I see you come out of Best Buy, um, I'll flash my lights and I'll 
come around and I'll pick you up. I said, good idea, thank you so much, you're the man. And I ran inside and I picked all my cables up. That's fine, that's the easy part of this story. I came outside and it's dumping with rain and I'm running across the car park looking like this and I see a white Lincoln Town car flash its lights and I said, fantastic. So I ran and I jumped into the driver's seat like this. No, I should do it like this so you can see. And I jumped in and I'm like soaked to the core. Like not only just wet, but like soaked to my very soul. And I'm thinking to myself, God, can this night be over? Let's go. I start talking to the gentleman. And it's at this moment that I'm not trusting my mind, but I am thinking, gosh, he looks different. Talking away. And I'm just kind of jabbering to myself. Oh, it's so busy inside. And middle of the night and it's pouring. And oh, my suede boots and blah, blah, blah. I talk to the guy. And he is looking at me with utter horror like this. And so I said, I'll just... A little bit unsure. I looked into the back seat. No word of a lie. There are two kids in the back seat staring at me with a face like this. And I jumped out of the car, deeply embarrassed. And another car, another white Lincoln Town car is flashing its lights like it's about to... And I jumped into that car and the driver was casing himself with laughter. And as speakers like myself want to do, I thought to myself, well, what on earth is this about? Because we're always looking for the story in the middle of these things. And I thought to myself, isn't it funny how sometimes we can do all the right things, but get it completely wrong? I mean, let's just think about this from like this story, because clearly this is a metaphor. It actually happened, but we're using it allegorically for something that we really want to talk together about this morning, which is, is it possible um, to be doing all the right things in business, but miss the bigger picture? And the answer is clearly yes. Because for me, what were my objectives of the evening? Go and get some cables. This is the bit where I need you to participate. Did, was I successful, yes or no? Get out of the rain and not soak my cables. Was I successful, yes or no? Get into the white Lincoln town car. Successful, yes or no? <laughs> completely wrong, though. Isn't it funny how you can do all the right things and get it completely wrong? Have you ever done this in business or in life or in, I mean, think about your intimate relationships. This is not only just a rule for business. This is like every single day for those of us who are married. Sometimes we know we can do the right things, but we get it completely wrong. This story, then, is a simple one. I mean, take, for example, this, this analogy and apply it to a brand, an organization who has done so many extraordinary things. They've done so much right, but they've also got so much wrong. A failure to not see the bigger picture meant regardless of all the wonderful things that they were doing right in any given day, they missed the bigger picture. Our conversation is how do we see and seize opportunities, but the... Maybe the biggest illusion of all is the fact that we can actually be building businesses that are winning from day to day and risk missing the bigger picture. I mean, let's just take Yahoo for an example because it's a topical one. I mean, have a look at this. Some of you guys know the history. Uh, 1998, Google were the upstart and they had a beautiful algorithm. Yahoo were obviously monetizing traffic through ad search and ad placement and, uh, and they declined. Google's pitch to them. They said, hey, you want to buy the algorithm for a million bucks? I mean, if you could build a time machine and travel back to 1998 and jump into that meeting, would you buy that algorithm? Yes, you'd scratch together a million dollars. But they declined the offer. So look, realizing their mistake, four years later, they did this. They offered three billion dollars. Google declined and said, how about five? They said, oh, it's way too much money. 82 now. I mean, what about this? 2008, Microsoft made a $40 billion offer to buy the whole thing. They declined. Last September, they capitulated for $4 billion to Verizon. You know the story. Now, this is not a a story of incompetence, because think about the complexity and the brilliance of what Yahoo had done. So many of the right things, but a failure to see the bigger picture meant they missed the whole boat. Our conversation today is how do you see and seize opportunities, and we've only got a short moment to think about this. 
I've got 15 useful minutes. And so what I want to do is not kind of go to the top of the mountain and have some esoteric conversation that lives in business abstraction, but actually bring something down to earth with some really earthy practical tips. Is that okay with you guys? Because the reality of understanding the future of technology is that if you think you know all the answers, you're either a liar, a madman, or Ray Kurzweil. And we're not quite sure which one he is just yet. Time will prove that. So here's what I would like to do. I'd like to, my, my clicker doesn't have amazing range, so I'm going to keep bouncing back up here. Three ideas just to kind of kickstart our kind of level of conversations for today. The first one is to watch and listen. Like if we stand any chance of being able to navigate the future well, steer our businesses, steer our teams, steer our own lives in the future, well, it pays to watch and listen. 30 years ago, John Naisbitt was the extraordinary author of Megatrends, and some of you have read this. And Megatrends was this, uh, this, this summation of all the emerging trends in technology at the time, 30 years ago. And Naisbitt was brilliant because he predicted the rise of kind of the informational society, the rise of decentralization, the rise of networks. He was brilliant. Here was his methodology. He said this. I just paid attention. In fact, he had the most simple practice in order to pay attention. Here's one that I, I maybe want to suggest, but I'm going to drop it in lightly because it comes with an asterisk, a big caveat. He said, hey, what I actually did was took a ruler and he measured column space in newspapers. For two years of his life, Naisbitt was like a subscription hog. And he got every newspaper that he could possibly get his hands on. And him and his team literally measured the column space that were given. And they put hashtags or they filed different things. And depending on how much column space in the world's newspapers were given to different conversations, that's how he surmised the most important trends that were going on right now. I mean, what a brilliant strategy. 30 years ago. Because, I mean, imagine if you took that tactic to the internet now. Let's just, hey, what are people talking about right now on the internet? How about, oh, the earth is flat. What? Has anybody noticed this? Have you noticed how much dribble there is on the internet? Yes or no? Have you seen this one? People will talk for days and they'll argue about whether the world is flat. I mean, I thought we'd covered that one off a couple of hundred years ago. What about this one? Did you know that Justin Timberlake is a time-traveling zombie from the year 1870? I mean, if you were measuring column space on the internet, you might get into a bit of trouble, don't you think? Yes or no? I mean, the problem with trend watching is, I mean, who are you watching and listening? Does that make sense? I mean, but it still is a pillar of our conversation. So number one is a very simple, and we're moving at the speed of light through some of these big thoughts, but it's enough to stir the pot at the start of this day. Number one. If we're going to stand a chance of seeing and seizing opportunities, we've got to watch and we've got to listen. But here's the biggest warning. We have to be very, very aware of the problems around this glut of information that we've got. And the biggest problem is simply known as the self-referencing web. The web, the monetized web, is designed to give you more of what you already think. You know this for a fact. If you, you've noticed this, that if you go shopping for something for the next week and a half, it'll keep trying to sell you the stuff on all of your internet advertorials. Isn't that true? And for every like that you have on your social media, it'll show you more of the same stuff. This echo chamber of the internet is critical. So if you stand a chance as a leader of your organization or just a smart, forward-thinking person of seeing and seizing the future, you have to deliberately get outside of your echo chamber. And the fastest and most simple way to do that, Dave, can I borrow one of your phones for a moment? Is to literally do this. Put that thing away. I was even watching here this morning as people were sitting here in this splendid auditorium having pre-thoughts about what this day was going to be about for them, flicking through their social media. Now, I'm not judging that because clearly I do that as well. But have you noticed that wherever I go, I take my internet, my experience of the world with me. Isn't that an interesting one? So I might be sitting on the beach in a foreign land and still connected to the day-to-day -day life of my friends back home. 
The problem is, if my attention is saturated with the stuff that I already know, only and exclusively all the time, I mean, you, we often talk about breaking down silos. Man, silos are organizational. What about like societal-wide silos, which are the echo chamber of your self-referencing web? Does that make sense? Be very, very cautious. If you are out there and you are trying to seize and see, see and seize the future, you have to deliberately get outside your echo chamber, which means put those devices down. Go and seek out the input of people who kind of annoy you. Because have you noticed how birds of a feather flock together? It's never more true than on the internet. Isn't that true? You could design an experience of life that suits your preferences, or you could deliberately go after. This is the role of diversity. So, number two, because we have to progress. You can make it. If you're going to see and seize the future, I mean, you can just go ahead and make it. We're going to be short on time here because one of the problems with trying to understand the future is a misunderstanding that it's the present that dictates the future, that it's the present that leads to the future. I know it's a sound, it's a, it's a strange sounding one, but we're going to flip it on its head because the reality is that it's the future that determines the present. And I'll tell you what I mean. It's not esoteric. It's not from a parchment from a Tibetan monastery. This is some practical stuff. It means this, that your vision of the future with your team, with your organization, determines the steps that you're making today in order to get there. Does that make sense? And so many people are waiting for the future to emerge so that they can make decisions and forgetting the fact that their decisions today are the very thing that create the future. We have to breeze through this quick but you have to take responsibility to make it. So I want to ask this very simple question. What do you see? Hey, Martin, you're the only name badge that I read on the way in, so this is why I'm coming after you. Hey, Martin, when I ask this question, the future, what do you see? Give me one kind of like 10-second thought. Go for it. Ah, conflict. I mean, that's the, that's the future. I mean, I, that's now as well, isn't it? What if I came and asked, what do you think when I say the future? What comes to mind? Colony on Mars. Colonies on Mars. Thank you, Elon Musk. There'll be a 200-foot bronze statue pointing to the heavens in San Francisco by the time I'm done. What do you think of? Doing it differently. Doing it differently. We have to do it differently. How about you? What comes to mind when you think of the future? Yeah, more connected people. This is an interesting one, particularly, again, with Elon Musk talking about neural nets this week. If you haven't, if you weren't across this, but this is the crowd that's probably across it. Direct interface with a net. I mean, this is an interesting one. Because depending on what you see when you think about the future is quite directive for the decisions you make today. I mean, usually it falls into two big buckets, doesn't it? The first... Has anybody got a friend like that when you think of the future? They're like, oh, we will be serving the machine overlords. Has anybody had any dinner time conversations like that? Or perhaps the flip side is... George Jetson's middle class utopia of the future with mid-air superhighways and enhanced pets and robot servants. I mean, dependent on your vision for the future, ironically, I want you to actually put points one and two together, because they do go together. We're making it. Our vision of the future is the thing that will create it. And we could, if we had more time, backtrack through the annals of science fiction and point at all the times where somebody created something so preposterous that dictated and led the creative journeys of organizations and given us what we have today. But regardless of what you think about the future, this is the era in which we find ourselves. The fourth industrial revolution. This era of the intertwining of digital and biological systems. This is us. I have a one-year-old daughter at home. And when I think about the future, I think about the decisions that she's going to have to make. Is she going to integrate? or not? 
Ray Kurzweil, because I am a believer, he says, somewhere around the year 2035, 2040, we're going to have to give robots rights. You say, what? Because people will supplement their organic systems with more than 60%. And so it'll be hard to tell what is a human and what is a robot. For that reason, we'll have to, this is a very distinct moment in history. In fact, in the last month, the leading artificial intelligence researchers of the planet, more than 100 of them, assembled in a place called Asilomar. And if you know Asilomar as a place, it's almost mythic because in the 1970s, a, a similar group got together to make decisions around the boundaries of our genetic explorations. This past month, they've gotten together to decide the boundaries of our quest for artificial intelligence. Stuart Russell, perhaps the leading billionaire thinker in regards to artificial intelligence, has suggested that this current 18-month period, now, one month in, 17 months ago, this period, the decisions we make here, sounds so grandiose. But he said this current 18 months, perhaps, will shape the future trajectory of every single person on the planet. These are heady times. This is an era of exoskeletons, of full mobility for our disabled citizens. This is an era of self-driving autonomous cars. Now, this isn't about you getting to work faster. Oh, my gosh. This is about people living where they want. I mean, if it was just about getting to work faster, that's two hours a day, 10 hours a week, 480 hours a year. That's two months of getting to and from work that you're going to save. But you know the reality? It's not even... People won't even, I mean, cities of the future, it's an interesting conversation, isn't it? Because if I can literally work from wherever I am with augmented reality and virtual reality, and regardless of the language that I speak, connect with my team, these are very heady times indeed. So, first strategy, watching and listening. Second strategy, actually making it I need you guys to create your vision of the future because that's what we'll be creating. I mean, this is an era of very intelligent systems bordering on artificial intelligence. This is Watson, IBM supercomputer, who is beating the pants off America's most successful game show contestants. Look at it, flogging them. Oh, but you guys probably already know this. This was in 2012. You know what is being used for now? Ontological treatments for large nations, Brazil, India, where there's not enough doctors to quite cover the prescription needs. And he's having a brilliant success rate. Why? Because he's less emotionally involved. And here we are personifying artificial intelligence already. This is interesting time indeed. And what about the implications? I mean, Deloitte asked 350,000 millennials, less than five years of work experience. Does anybody have someone in their team who has less than five years in the workforce, yes or no? That's a real question. So you know who I'm talking about, right? Maybe that's your child or your teenager. I said, hey, what do you think about this era that we're in? Two-thirds of that 350,000 said, huh, I don't think my job is going to exist within the next 10 years. So McKinsey said, interesting study. Here's our counter study. So instead of an opinion poll, why don't we do a functional analysis? And they said, here's the current technology, and here's the current needs. And what we can surmise is that over the same period, maybe we're going to see a 60% reduction in total job functions. Not like a, a full redundancy, but a replacement. That's 60% of our global workforce that will have to retrain. I mean, think of the implications for this. Some of you guys are in education. What's your appetite, if you're 19 years of age, to go and study for five years if you know that your job role, your function, your industry might not exist in 10? <sighs> Some prescient thoughts. The final, obviously, we're going to skip Gary Kasparov. But Kasparov got beaten by a computer in 1997. The simple strategy is this, something that no one thought would ever happen. It's complex, it's creative, this is chess. Kasparov is the greatest player of all time. Kasparov, beaten publicly by Deep Blue, had three options, really. I want you to write these down. Capitulate, compete, or collaborate. Simple. We can capitulate. 
We can compete, which we will lose every time, or we can choose to collaborate. The latter is what Kasparov chose to do, and in 2005 re-emerged with a new version of chess called Freestyle Chess, which is heavily augmented with data. My final thought, double click, this will be my closing thought, double click on our biggest problems. If you want to see and seize the future, if you want to understand why technology exists, what is the purpose of technology full stop, it is to solve our biggest problems. In the midst of our biggest problems are our biggest opportunities. It stands to reason. If you can find a, a problem for your team and solve it and scale it, solve a problem for a million people, solve a problem for a billion people, you'll change the world. I mean, oh, one minute. Create unholy alliances. This is our conversation. How do we break down the silos? I mean, it wasn't too long ago that Apple and music collaboration, my goodness, that was a crazy thought. Steve Jobs, what business do you have in music? Now it seems so natural. What about Microsoft and gaming? Microsoft and video games? You're kidding me, right? What on earth is Bill and Steve Ballmer going to do with a video game? Their most profit, profitable center. What about Facebook and VR? Doesn't make sense right now. 18 months. What about Uber and everything? <laughs> It's easy to collaborate with people in your industry who think the same, but if you want to see and seize the future, create unholy alliances. Deliberately get outside of your echo chamber and pursue it. So my simple thoughts for you as we open this event is quite clear. Technology, we find ourselves in an unprecedented, almost mythic era of human history. It's ours to make. You can either seize it or we can capitulate but the challenge is yours. Thanks for having me.